I welcome you all, welcoming you all in this new um, series of the Italian Mediterranean Colloquium uh, for this semester, which will still be online on Zoom, which is it's not a bad thing if you combine online uh, with a restaurant with the speakers the day after, I should say. Um, so we have three, uh, two more events this semester. I'm gonna uh, post the link later on uh, in the chat for you if you want to register in the uh, other events. Uh, the events of the Italian Mediterranean Colloquium are um, co-sponsored by the Italian department and the European Institute, which we thank very much. So uh, our event today involves uh, two speakers and two respondents. One among the respondents is me, so I'm not going to present myself. Okay, let me just say that I'm Costantina Zano. I am a historian and I am uh, in the Italian department at Columbia University. Now, uh, I will present though my, our speakers. Um, so the first is uh, David Dopasso, who is the Itzvan, uh, Itzvan Dick uh, visiting professor in East Central European Studies at Columbia University. Uh, he's a historian of the Habsburg Empire in the 18th century. His research lies at the intersection of urban history, diaspora studies, and historical anthropology. David is the author of the monograph Lorient Avienne au XVIIIe siècle, uh, published by Oxford University Studies in the Enlightenment in 2015. And uh, his current project concerns the social and political life of Muslims in 18th century Habsburg cities. He's also the co-director co of the Franco-German research project Trieste, City of Empires. Thank you, David, uh, and welcome. Our second speaker is Salvatore Pabalardo, who is an associate professor of English and comparative literature at Towson University, where he teaches courses that range from the ancient Mediterranean to modern world literature. His research interests include 19th and 20th century European literature, Austrian and Italian modernism, and Mediterranean studies. He's the author of the really beautiful book I had the pleasure to read, Modernism in Trieste, the Habsburg Mediterranean and the Literary Invention of Europe, 1870 to 1945, published by Bloomsbury in 2021. Hi, Salvatore, and welcome, and thank you for being here. Now, finally, uh, uh, my friend, uh, very good friend, uh, Franco Baltasso, will be uh, acting as a respondent along with me. Let me present it him to you. He's uh, an assist assistant professor of Italian and director of the Italian program at Bard College. His main research interests are 20th century literature, art, and intellectual history. His courses and publications focus on the complex relations between fascism and modernism, the legacy and memory of political violin violence, uh, violence in Italy, I'm sorry, and the idea of the Mediterranean in modern aesthetics. He authored two books, one on the Holocaust uh, survivor Primo Levi, Il Cerchio di Gesso, Primo Levi, Narratore e Testimone, published in 2007, as well as the book, again in Italian, on uh, Curzio Malaparte, La letteratura crutele, Caput, La pelle e la caduta della civiltà europea, published in 2019. He is currently finalizing a book manuscript titled Against the Redemption, Democracy, Memory and Literature in Post-Fascist Italy. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see these numbers in our uh, meeting, which are actually increasing, I'm so happy. So um, let me tell you two words about the structure of the event, and then I will give the word to the speakers. So David and Salvador's talks will be 15 minutes each. After that, Franco and I will offer short responses in terms of thoughts and questions, 10 minutes each. A maximum 10 minutes. After the responses of the presenters, like five minutes respond, uh, response, we will open to general questions and thoughts from the public. You can either raise hands, type Q in the chat, or uh, if you want to, to ask a question, or even type your question there. The whole event will last for no more than one hour and 30 minutes. And uh, final thing to say that it is recorded and it will be uploaded on our website in due time. So that said, the word is to David. 
Thank you so much for, for, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to present this research. So just let me share with you uh, a couple of slides. This paper, you can actually, uh, I mean, this is a paper that is going to be published in a collecting volume, I hope, this autumn, and you have a QR code. So if you want, you can flash it and access directly to the proof. It's almost the final version uh, of the paper, and you, you, you will have access to the entire demonstration. And this research is, uh, as uh, Constantine had said, actually, at the intersection of two projects. The first project is a book project, the project on Trieste as a city of empires with an S. And it's an attempt to understand how the city used the resources of the different empire over time and over the Mediterranean and Central Europe to develop itself. And a forthcoming project uh, that uh, hopefully will be developed with the University of Leiden on the social uh, and political history of Muslims in early modern uh, Habsburg, uh, Habsburg city. So when I was a student, I've been taught the history of the Habsburg and the Ottoman Empire uh, in the perspective of the clash of civilization. And uh, to be honest, it was in the uh, two decades ago, to be honest, uh, the, 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 the way this story uh, uh, was taught at the Sorbonne at that time was an history of the intermediaries and especially an history of the diasporas. The diaspora was able to connect the uh, two diverse and asymmetrically diverse empire and provided another history uh, of uh, the Christian Muslim relationship, an history of trade, an history of connection. But uh, this history was really focused on the intermediaries. And from the perspective of Vienna in the 18th century, that was my, 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 my very first research uh, on the Habsburg history. This was not really what I could see. The interaction between the Habsburg and the Ottoman Empire were actually, from the perspective again of the Habsburg administration, quite direct and did not necessarily need intermediaries and were not organized by corporate bodies such as nations, I mean, group of nations organized uh, around the specific privileges and having some uh, civic right, being corporate bodies associated to the governance of the empire or of uh, specific cities. And uh, at some point working on Vienna led me directly to, to, to try to apply uh, this model to several cities of the Habsburg Empire on Pest, on Temeshvar, Timisoara, and of course, on uh, the city of Trieste. Trieste has been defined as uh, la città dei gruppi, the city of the communities. And I, we can definitely understand why when we look at the archive, uh, the Austrian archive in, in Vienna, everything is organized communities by communities. So we, the starting point is the legal community, the community that has been acknowledged by the political power. And we have this easy perspective to enter into the history of the empire through uh, official minorities. But what I wanted to, 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 the idea I wanted to, 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 to develop today is that this perspective is only the perspective of the elite and only a perspective of a part of the elite. As soon as we look at the subaltern, the middle class, the lower class, or only the wealthy merchants who were not able to be uh, acknowledged or to uh, publicly practice their religion, like the Muslim, this is a very different story that uh, we can tell. So the article that I want to present today is about this uh, uh, investigation, a collection of statements by Agostino Buzzi, who was a captain of the port of Trieste in 1779, and collection of statements that dealt with the disparition, the, the disappearance of uh, a, a young Muslim boy uh, named Solimano. So I briefly summarize here uh, uh, the case studies. So two influent Muslim merchants from Kenya, Osmanaga and Wesepaga went in a business, business trip to Vienna and led their servant Solimano at Pietro Padze place. One night, Padze noticed that Solimano was missing. Wesepaga returned to Trieste and ran his own investigation. The young grocers told him what uh, they heard from the other kids of the city. Several witnesses confirmed that Solimano was actually in Venice. He really ran away. Two Greeks were accused, but no concrete evidence could be presented. And of course, the Greek denied being responsible of uh, the disappearance of the kid. Uh, 
Rishi Paga reported his investigation to Osmanaga in Vienna. Osmanaga sent a petition to Maria Teresa, the Habsburg ruler at that time. And finally, Maria Teresa asked Agustino Buzzi, the captain of the port of Trieste, to officially investigate and collected three, he collected three different versions and reported to Vienna. This is properly the document that we have. So those two ver so those three versions are first Solimano has been kidnapped by the Greeks. Second, Solimano ran away because he would have been forced to convert to Islam and he wanted to live with the Greek. And the third version was Solimano ran away to live himself a free life. We don't know which one is a good one, but this is actually not the point. The point is that the different statements collected by uh, Agostino, Buzzi, uh, Agostino Buzzi just open a window on uh, a history of Trieste from the street and help us to better understand the social life of Trieste in the 18th century from the perspective, especially from the perspective of the subaltern and among the subaltern from the perspective of the teenagers. So with uh, this research, I try to, to provide a definition of what could be a trans-imperial city, of course, in the discussion with what Natalie Rotman uh, has already uh, introduced about the trans-imperial subject in, uh, in, in, in Venice. So from this collection of statements, First, I understand Trieste. I, I, I studied Trieste as a highly diverse and relatively autonomous civil society. We can precisely see that through the diversity of language that has been used by the different witnesses. So here, for example, we have uh, uh, Osman Aga who uh, uh, made his statements in uh, Ottoman Turkish and signed in Ottoman Turkish, so he needed an interpreter. Here uh, we have uh, concretely the interpreter who signed for uh, Reise Paga, another Muslim merchant, who was not really who was able to understand Italian but not able to speak it. We have many other different languages that has been uh, that were spoken in the city of, of Trieste at that time. Here you have a mention of the idiomat. Idiomate Illyrico, meaning the Serbo-Croatian, and referring to the statement of a 19-year-old boy from Mostar in Bosnia, but who were uh, settled in Trieste. I can show you many other examples, statement in Greek, uh, signature in, in the Greek alphabet, other signature made, other statement made by Greek people in Greek, but signed in the Latin alphabet, a huge diversity of languages used by the people of Trieste uh, with uh, the Habsburg administration, and most of them just were totally illiterate and signed with a cross, which is also something very interesting when we want to deconstruct these documents, meaning that they were not properly able to check their own statement, and the Habsburg administration reshaped the story to make it legible, for, to make the society legible for, for, for itself. This is a real limit. But what I found quite interesting among these statements and about uh, the linguistic diversity is that the different witness played with that saying that oh no when you know for example Girolamo Popa he, he would have said that his father was, was responsible for the missing of the young kid and he said oh no no I didn't say that actually I cannot properly speak Italian so this guy didn't really understood what I said and even one of the plaintiffs Osman uh, Aga uh, he finally retracted because his accusation were too strong and he said oh no I don't speak German, and my, my lawyer didn't really understood, didn't really understand what I say. So he, he, he retracted in order to protect himself. This is very interesting to see how the society played with the administration to protect himself, to manage his, his space of freedoms, and the Habsburg administration at the end of the day not really being able to 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 understand or accurate or maybe to manage the social relationship within the city the city of Trieste. So maybe first, this is the first part of the definition. Second part of the definition, the social fabric that uh, actually challenged the corporate bodies and the ethno-religious communities. So the historiography about 18th century Trieste is more, almost exclusively about the corporate bodies. And there is a, a, a lot of works focusing on the Greek diaspora in 18th century Trieste. What I mean, the, 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 hypothesis, the serious hypothesis we can develop from uh, this collection of statements is that actually the Greek diaspora, the Greek nation, that is what, uh, like it was called at that time, was actually very weak. We are in 1779. Uh, this is one year before the nation split into parts. 
I mean, it divided into part between the Illyrian, Illyrian Greeks and the Oriental Greeks. And what we learn from the statement is that, okay, the Greek diaspora, the Greek nation is a legal community, but this legal community is uh, 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 ethnically, linguistically, and religiously diverse. And it is not, it, it did not rest on social solidarity uh, 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 among this member. For example, one of the statements was a statement of uh, an influence, influential uh, Greek woman, woman, and she said, oh yeah, I heard about the story, someone came to tell me the story, and, I, and she said, this, this is not of my business and I don't want to be involved. So, so very clearly, she didn't want it to be part of it, and she don't, didn't want it to grant it protection to the Greek who were involved in the who are potentially involved in the in the in the missing of 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 uh, Solimano. Instead of that, what we understand from the social fabric of the 18th century Trieste is the organization of trans-imperial clientele, clientele made by people from different backgrounds, people from different religions, who were strongly established in different empires. For example, the two Muslim merchants who were complaining about the missing of the young boy, they, 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 they got the protection of two very uh, 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 strong uh, Catholic uh, 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 merchants originally from the Ottoman Empire, who got later of naturalization from the Habsburg emperor and settled in Vienna and Trieste. They were definitely socially well integrated into the city. Last uh, part of the definition, and I think I'm almost already running out, out of time, is uh, uh, the focus that with this collection of statements, we can put on the sociability of the teenager to try to understand the social life of Trieste in a very different way. One of the teenagers, the uh, most important witness, he explained that actually he was a friend uh, of Solimano and they were friends across three different empires. They were meeting all the time. And he is the one who met uh, twice or three times Solimano in Venice after his uh, disappearance. What we understand from the statement of this teenager is that actually the teenagers were able to uh, add a social life across the religious community, across the professional uh, 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 communities, across the different neighborhood of the city of Trieste, of course, with the statement across the different empires that had some point overlap uh, in, uh, on the city uh, of uh, Trieste. And maybe we can reinterpret the disappearance of Solimano because he, he really looked like actually uh, the, the classical domestic, uh, domestic servant of the 18th century literature. So for example, for me, he, he really looked like the kind of Figaro you know, the character from Beaumarchais who is playing his master or the Leporello of Lorenzo da Ponte and Mozart in Don Giovanni who wanted to have a free life uh, uh, and, uh, and far il gentiluomo, like he said in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Don Giovanni. So Limano was able to play him, his master, his masters. He was able to play his, uh, the Greek uh, uh, community. He was able to leave the city of Trieste to have a free life. Uh, already playing with the different identity uh, he had. And as a conclusion, this is, I think, just an invitation to pay more attention on these people who had no civic right, but that doesn't mean that they had no leverage to be integrated in the city and to operate in uh, 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 between empires. This is one of the reasons why I'm precisely focusing on the Muslims, not to, 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 to do the history of another community, but to, 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 to explore the history of a very diverse population with no civic rights, right, but that a population that was really able to cope with this very challenging process of uh, uh, social integration in the early modern uh, cities. Thank you so much. Thank you David. very much. <laughs> um, can you stop sharing so that I pass yeah, the course. word to Salvatore? Thank you so much. Salvatore, without further ado, to you. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, you know, good, good, good evening in, in, in Italy. Buonasera, um, dobro večer, calispera you know, Guten Abend, all the languages of, uh, of, of Trieste. I would like to uh, thank Constantina and Franco for having me. I'm excited about uh, David uh, being here. And uh, today I want to talk about um, probably the thing that fascinated and excited me the most when I uh, wrote my book, Modernism in, um, in Trieste. So I have to say, I'm a literary scholar. 
And so, you know, I'm in the wonderful company of historians, um, even though my camp is, is literature. And so I was uh, looking at Trieste uh, in the context of uh, its modernist literatures uh, and the plural, and definitely the ways in which Trieste is still part of the Austrian literary imagination with uh, Robert Musi, and then obviously the Italians in Trieste with uh, Ita Rosvei, Luci Slata, but um, James Joyce, uh, the, the Triestino, uh, James Joyce, and then uh, Theodor Deugler, the uh, German poet uh, of, uh, of Trieste, and Srećko Kosova, obviously, uh, from the Slovenian, uh, from the Slovenian community. And what I saw um, in these modernist texts is that a trope uh, came up uh, consistently. And initially I thought this was a, uh, you know, a rabbit hole I was uh, going down and that rabbit hole ended in the book. Um, because they imagined uh, the origins of, of, of Europe via Trieste um, and not locating it in um, the Greek and the Roman world, uh, but in the world of the Phoenicians, the Semitic um, population of traders and seafarers. And so that is in many ways uh, one of the concerns that I have today, right? And you know, how can we think of Trieste as a Mediterranean city um, in a context that expands from its um, immediate Adriatic uh, context, right? We think of the Adriatic as a pretty self-contained sub-region of, of the Mediterranean and via these uh, Phoenicians, the kind of coordinates uh, of this kind of cultural and historical identity are definitely, um, are definitely uh, shifted. So the uh, Phoenicians are, uh, as I said, a Semitic um, ancient uh, population who were um, the trading rivals of, of the Greeks for a long time, and then became the arch enemy of Rome with the Carthaginians, because Carthage is a um, Phoenician, uh, Phoenician colony. And so I was thinking, where is this coming from? And why do these authors who, you know, um, come from very different languages and very different literary traditions, why do they all converge towards the Phoenicians? And so I started digging into the kind of cultural history of, of Trieste. And when you do that in the 19th century, uh, you have to come to terms with uh, La Società di Minerva and the um, Archeografo Triestino, which is the publication which starts in 1829. And um, what I find there is a debate that um, starts in 1870 uh, and intensifies in, in um, the 1880s, in which historians, ancient historians, um, dilettante archaeologists uh, and antiquarians start writing and publishing about the Phoenician presence in the, um, in the Adriatic. And it is extremely surprising, uh, fascinating, and, and exciting what, um, what these um, what the intellectuals uh, do. And I will mention a couple of, um, a couple of names. One of them is uh, Guglielmo Eisenstetter, uh, Guglielmo or Wilhelm Eisenstetter, who in um, 1870 uh, comes up with a uh, etymological suggestion for the term Tergeste, which is the name of the first settlement of, of Trieste. And he comes up with a very surprising etymology. Today we would call it a folk uh, uh, etymology because he argues that the term that derives from the Phoenician Tarshish. So uh, he was looking for the location of the biblical uh, Tarshish and he identifies it in, in Trieste. And now beyond the faulty um, etymology of that, um, of that, of that term, what was important in this is um, not only the quantity of Phoenician settlements in the Adriatic in, um, in, in, in prehistory uh, up until the archaic uh, uh, period, but also the quality of these uh, settlements. 
And um, Eisenstadter in many ways uh, participates in a debate, um, and you see here kind of the rise of classical studies in, uh, in Western Europe in the 19th century, which kind of identifies the Greeks and the Romans, the cradle of Western civilization, um, and excludes the Semitic uh, Phoenicians, obviously tinged by um, an anti-Semitism that is not being uh, hidden by, uh, by, by, by anyone. But the ways in which these uh, Phoenician settlements were interpreted uh, were, um, they looked at them in terms of temporary trading posts. So yes, the Phoenicians are expanding in uh, the Mediterranean from the Levant uh, to uh, the central Mediterranean, especially uh, Sicily and Sardinia, and then in the Western uh, Mediterranean with, uh, with Car Carthage and uh, Cadiz, so also beyond the, um, the Strait of Gibraltar and navigating in the Atlantic, which is something that neither the Greeks nor the Romans were uh, capable of, um, of, of doing. But these etymologies um, established that these, um, the, the present, the Phoenician present in the Adriatic was not um, sporadic, was not temporary, but it was permanent and in many ways identity shaping. And not just for Trias. Right, uh, the entire region, especially Istria uh, and Dalmatia, now are seen as um, Phoenician in, uh, in in origin. Now, obviously, the idea is far fetched, incorrect, um, and, um, and and silly in, in, in many ways. Um, and yet, it was extremely successful, extremely uh, powerful. And uh, it, it started circulating uh, in, in this large debate. Now, I want to say that Eisenstetter publishes this very short article, Antichissima um, Trieste uh, e Finici, uh, in the Osservatore Triestino, and not in, um, in the Archeographer Triestino. So the Osservatore Triestino. Uh, was um, much more of a uh, popular uh, publication. It was often seen as the kind of mouthpiece of the Austrian, um, the Austrian imperial um, administration. So someone, you know, in, in, in Italian circles might have seen it uh, with, uh, with, with suspicion. But the person who picks up this idea that is suggested by uh, Guglielmo slash Wilhelm um, Eisenstetter is a Greek. Triestine, uh, Pietro Pervanoglu, who was born in Trieste, moves to um, Athens, where he teaches at the university, and then in the late 1860s returns to, uh, to Trieste. And Pervanoglu embraces this, uh, this idea in the same way that, uh, for instance, um, Pietro Candler, uh, who is you know, operating with Domenico Rossetti as one of the uh, kind of leading um, intellectuals in, uh, in, in the city, even though they were trained as lawyers, right? So they, they like to talk about archaeology a lot, but they're dilettantes. They, they, they're not uh, professional archaeologists. And so Kandla uh, embraces this idea of a, a Phoenician um, settlement uh, in, uh, in, in, in Tergesta. And then Pervanoglu picks up this strange idea and uh, continues to expand uh, the scope. And so not only is Tergeste original Phoenician, but the entire region, Istria and Dalmatia. Um, and the way he gets to this conclusion is by claiming that the Illyrians, the original inhabitants of the regions, in reality were of Phoenician descent because they descended from Illyrius, who was the son of Cadmus, a Phoenician prince and uh, son of uh, King Agenor, uh, the Phoenician king um, in, in, in Ovid, and brother of, uh, of the Phoenician Europa. And so all of a sudden, you have this conversation uh, that is uh, widespread and often kind of accepted um, in the Apiolo of Estino that the Illyrians may be of uh, Phoenician descent. The Phoenicians, uh, according to Pervanoglu, uh, introduce the Bronze Age uh, in the, um, the Adriatic. And um, in many ways, even the term Adria, 
the etymology of Adria, the term, according to Perbanoglu, is Phoenician as well. He's not the only one, because then you have um, another figure, uh, Pietro Tomasin, who again continues with this Semitic uh, etymology of these terms. And so even the terms Italia and Istria seem to be of Phoenician um, origin. Um, you have another kind of um, archaeologist, Emilio Frauer, who claims that uh, Listria et Ita Semitica. So Istria is, is all uh, Semitica, all, uh, is all Phoenician. One of the problems um, of these antiquarians is the fact that um, when it comes to Greek and Roman history, you know, they, they are on more or less a firm ground, but anything that precedes the Greeks um, it's very difficult for them to, to decipher. And so any kind of uh, local uh, culture, uh, for instance, the Liburnians uh, in the Adriatic or the uh, Illyrians for um, Pervanoglu become, um, become all of uh, Phoenician, uh, Phoenician descent. And so in many ways, this um, was kind of meeting uh, another popular uh, legends that was circulating in the Trieste, and that is that uh, the founder of Trieste was Tergesteo, uh, a hero from the Trojan uh, War in one uh, version, uh, and a Phoenician settler uh, on, uh, on, on the other hand. And so Trieste, uh, in the words of Eisenstetter, becomes the delight of the navigator. It becomes a safe haven where the Phoenicians can um, establish themselves and um, prosper as a culture before the archaic Greeks take, um, take over. And so- Sal Salvador, two minutes. Yes, okay. And so this becomes um, extremely important because then while this debate is, is happening, uh, Sigmund Freud arrives in Trieste in 1876 and he, his letters really show that he is aware of this, uh, of this debate. And um, he is enamored with Tergeste uh, and the ancient, uh, the ancient history. And via Freud, you have this kind of opening up of, um, in, in many ways, he, he functions as a bridge to the modernists who then uh, pick up on this Phoenician origin of, um, of, of Europe which again starts as faulty uh, archaeology. Um, but again, even today, if you read uh, any kind of um, travel guide uh, in Trieste that uh, thinks about the history of, of Trieste, this idea of a Phoenician hero founding uh, the city uh, still has, um, uh, has, has a lot of traction. And even if it is not uh, necessarily, um, you know, the, the main the main narrative it is not uh, excluded uh, it is not excluded either and so I'm really fascinated by this uh, by this faulty but very uh, widespread and popular idea that imagines Trieste as completely, completely uh, different. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So. Um, Really, I want to thank you both for keeping uh, within the time limit, but also for these superb presentations. Um, I know more from, from what you've said because I've read uh, <laughs> your work. And so I will uh, offer a comment on what I have read, some things that you have already mentioned, of course. Um, we have divided labor here, so I will respond chiefly to David, while Franco will focus his response mostly on Salvador's paper. However, I could not but notice common themes here, which I will address also to both speakers. Okay, so to begin with David, I would love to discuss with you, David, the way you employ the notion of diasporas, and in general, uh, the way you treat all these itinerant men, women, and children whose lives transcended narrowly bounded geographical, religious, and linguistic areas, and who moved at will across the Mediterranean, East Central Europe, and the Italian and Balkan peninsulas. Usually, when we encounter this label, the label diasporas, right, we think of organized communities abroad, often presented as pieces of national and religious life scattered here and there 
uh, in places far away from their true home. In fact, until recently, scholarship defined diasporas in relation to a center, usually national, but also imperial center, regional, mm -hmm. continental, religious, or ethnic, right? From which they were considered to be dispersed and to which ideally one day they would return. A recent high, uh, historiographical trend has nevertheless, as you point out in the piece I read, reversed the terms of how we understand this relationship between centers and diasporas, abandoning the notion of national or religious diasporas for that of diasporas as such. Instead of being an emblem of the unity of a dispersed people with an imagined homeland as a point of reference, diasporas become for this new generation of historians an expression of diversity, of a multiplicity of loyalties and belongings. Movement is treated by these scholars not as an exception, but as the rule, the rule. People always circulated, created networks and settled in certain places. And these places, these flaws became by turns their homes. As uh, Dominique Ray, who is here among us, argued in a recent fabulous article, in a recent fabulous collection, which I co-edited, uh, she argued, that actual limit the, that the actual limits of displacement are hard to imagine in an era of such constant geographical and political change in a world of vast empires custom unions miniature mini states and semi independent principalities the frontiers of which are were constantly shifting it is unclear what home and abroad really meant in this sense traveling from one city to another or from one state to another might present uh, represent for many a circulation within a familiar space where they could feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, it is within this new trend that I locate your work. It seems to me that you're suggesting that these people were diasporas only when seen through the eyes of the state. Uh, uh, this category being the result of administrative attempts to understand circulation and to govern a plural uh, society. What you are describing, indeed, appears like a gigantic, a gigantic mosaic of, of moving into the individuals who escaped the attention of a powerless state or even manipulated on their own behalf, right? And uh, amazing in this respect is uh, the image you give of this linguistic patchwork, which apparently worked just fine, right? Um, with the different actors, not just navigating through linguistic diversity, but also manipulating this diversity for their profit. Um, what is more intriguing to me, and, um, and for those who know my work, know I couldn't agree more, is that you're telling us that the only way to grasp what was really going on uh, uh, in, in this mobile and interactive universe is to move our focus away from official and acknowledged religious or national communities, the legally defined minor minorities, right? And place it on individuals. You're telling us to go beyond the idea of Trieste as a segregated city and unearth a more complex universe through microhistories. So my question is, do you believe that microhistory can liberate us from the burden created by the nature of the archives and by our uh, preconceived notions of the world. So my second point is a question to both speakers. Uh, David, you talk about a highly linguistically, religiously and legally plural society, an integrated region in which individuals circulated between empires and communities. But you never mentioned, I noticed, cosmopolitanism. Salvatore, you talk instead about a local cosmopolitanism, but you are critical to the nostalgic views of Trieste as a cosmopolitan failed opportunity. I want to hear more about what you think in respect to this concept from both of you and why you think it can be useful or harm, harmful. My final point, again addressed to both of you, concerns the Mediterranean. Um, Let's start from the title of our panel, Trieste, a Mediterranean city. Well, I know if I, I was the one who chose it, but uh, 
is it justified? Can the Mediterranean serve indeed as a useful framework of historical and literary analysis here? Uh, for my part, I am convinced that it can because entangled histories of the kind cannot be written unless we adopt a regional framework, unless we open up our gaze uh, to the Mediterranean Sea, to the empires that it nurtured during uh, this time, and to the connections that it engendered. Salvadore talks about the need to mediterranize Europe, that is to see Europe as consisting of multicultural regions rather than monolithic states. But I want to hear more on this. In fact, what I loved about the work of both of you is that you treat Trieste as a trans-imperial node. You place emphasis on the city, the locality. You both treat the unit of the city as an alternative to the empire or the nation state, or at least this is how I see it. Right? Um, in treating Trieste as a center of transregional and transcultural networks, transimperial and transnational later, right? Uh, both works defy the center and create new geographies. David reconstructs a, a geography, Ottoman Habsburg and Venetian geography, which has all but disappeared from Smyrna to Crete, then to the Cyclades, Peloponnesus, the Ionian Islands, Trieste, Venice, and then Vienna. While Salvatore detaches Trieste from its Italian geographical framework and reclaims it for Austrian and Habsburg studies. So thank you both for these excellent contributions. Now I will pass the word to Franco. And now I have a difficult task because I would, I would love to hear the, 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 you know, the answer to your questions because they're very, very important. And I would say, you know, they anticipate in a way what I, would, I wanted to, um, to discuss with, it, especially with, with Salvatore since, uh, um, but I will take uh, uh, this opportunity to, to move the conversation to, um, you know, to a more um, literary oriented uh, um, discussion. Also, because uh, I come from literary studies and, you know, studies of uh, ideology, aesthetics, and so on and so forth. I, I love reading uh, Salvatore's book, especially because of the, its richness, uh, its rigor, and we all we all uh, agree on that his passion when we described before the antiquarian quest for finding another archaeology, another genealogy of, of Trieste. I can see there is a lot of intellectual, uh, you know, thrust going on there. Also, in order to apply new categories to a topic like Trieste, that has been, especially in the Italian case within Italian studies, I would say extensively, um, extensively uh, in uh, investigated. But this is not enough. Apparently, be just because uh, investigating from a from a strictly national perspective doesn't uh, say much today, uh, as it didn't say much yesterday, uh, to what we, um, we we you know to the to the possibility to the to the prowess of a, of a, of, a, of the culture of Trieste of a multinational multilingual culture of Trieste. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Um, discusses one point in particular to move to the next ones. So the fact that when we discuss about, I mean, the title is Modernism in Trieste. So the main authors that uh, um, Salvatore uh, investigates in his book are among many other, of course, but the, the main chapters are about Musil, uh, Svevo, and Joyce, that are three great uh, um, you know, uh, canonical authors of, uh, of uh, European modernism. But uh, what I find interesting is that uh, when we discuss about modernism in general, we tend to uh, start a, a discussion coming from the metropole, the big capitals of modernism, Paris, Benjamin, of course, and so many other, London, uh, Berlin, in, the, in Vienna, uh, Prague, and so on and so forth. In the case of Italy, for instance, we always see the modernism from the point of view of Milan, which was the industrial city, the birthplace of futurism, and so on and so forth. What I, I, by reading your book, Salvatore, made me think that it is impossible to think of Trieste, Trieste, and so on and so forth, as a capital. 
uh, which speaks volume on how to intend, how we want to investigate further the culture that was born there, especially in, in let's call it a modern period. Not being a capital allows us to further inquiries. And your book illustrates this because uh, it's a, a place of, uh, of encounter of intertwining of traditions. You spoke about uh, uh, Freud and of course of Phoenician um, you know, antiquated appropriation of a possible delusional, I don't know, uh, past that is, uh, it was actually part of the modernist culture of that time. You know, claiming we come from the Phoenicia is not the different than claiming we come from a, a different alternative history in other parts of Europe at that time. Uh, despite we completely, as you point out, different aims. Uh, so the work is encroached in a social intellectual history of the time, which is, which is important. But of course, uh, the literary component is key to understand uh, why this, the, the cultural production of Trieste stands out in this moment. Again, um, going back to the idea of capital, the capital is uh, the, the uh, you know, epitomization of uh, ethno-national linguistic cohesion. And if, if you think about it, you know, French culture is Parisian culture and uh, so on and so forth for London. Trieste is not a capital, cannot be a capital because it's part of an empire of different uh, non-national non allegiances. And you pointed out that very well. That reminds me of when I met uh, and I had the luck of interviewing Boris Pavel, one of the great writers from, from Trieste, of Slovenian uh, nationality, but a, a Triestino. The, uh, he was there when the, the Slovenian national home, the Narodni Dom, was uh, burned by, by the fascists uh, uh, right after the Second World War. He was a kid there and still alive is more than 100 years old. And uh, he was uh, in Trieste when, uh, uh, you know, during the fascist period when he was of course, uh, uh, you know, ostracized and marginalized and, and beaten as a Slovenian. And uh, he ended up in concentration camp uh, after serving the Italian army in, um, even in Africa, in the concentration camps in Germany because it was part of the resistance. But when he came back to Trieste after, after the war, he decided not to join the new Yugoslavia, but to remain Trieste because Trieste was a city. He told me uh, that Trieste before Second World War was the biggest Slovenian city in the world, meaning bigger than, there were more Slo Slovenes in Trieste than in Ljubljana. And, and, I, and I asked, why didn't you, you didn't join like, uh, uh, Yugoslavia first and then Slovenia when he, he became independent because Trieste uh, is Slovenian too and uh, it's interesting how you still see in the in the streets of Trieste writings like Trist Jenash which means that Trieste is ours but this is not always uh, a progressive and, and, uh, and the easy way to conceive of the city because of course there's a lot of nationalism going on there like when you go to Istria you say the writing of Fiume with the, the you've written as a V in clearly Roman slash fascist ways so just to see that all these connections are not always uh, um, you know positive there's a lot, Trieste is also um, a city uh, Marina Cataruzza wrote, wrote Trieste as a that's the place where the oriental border, which was the, uh, which is the locus where the European, no, the Italian, sorry, attempt to be a great power uh, was tested and eventually failed. So there is also all these things going on. And, if it, you know, when Magris told me about uh, um, Boris Power was saying that, yeah, but he's still uh, within a nationalist frame after all these years. So this is something that should be taken into consideration. And uh, there is a number of writers that, the, and even historian, I put just one that wrote an, an amazing book that has been has not been studied as much as it deserves. Franco Cousin, Jewish writer, uh, Jewish historian, sorry, who wrote the Anti Storia d'Italia, the Anti History of Italy, published in 1947, arguing for keeping Trieste as a free city, not under the uh, <laughs> the control of the Allies, of course, but as a free port. And uh, starting from literature, like uh, that is not just a history, an anti history of Italy, is an anti history of Italian literature. Because literature became for these uh, for these uh, uh, intellectuals that definitely didn't come from the lower classes, um, the way to be uprooted. See, if uprootedness is one of the way of discussing Trieste, uh, choosing the Italian nationality was choosing Italian literature as a tradition, which is something that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, also, because it, uh, uh, it it undermines the national paradigm in a specific way. Uh, because 
before the nation, before the ethnic community came the spiritual community. And again, this has been the great delusion of the 20th century. But the role of literature in, uh, in creating this, in undermining this, as you show in your book, it, I think it should be taken into, into consideration. Um, just, uh, I mean, there's so much going on in this book and uh, I'm, I'm just go very, very short with the rest. I like how you end the book with a, a in a conversation with uh, Derrida and, uh, and Magris, and especially regarding Magris, I think about uh, not just uh, his most famous book, but Danube, but also Microcosms, which is a book that came out in the, in the late 90s and is trying to process that all the ideals, all the great, uh, even the nostalgia for empire that, uh, that you know, that is a, a big part of the uh, history of Trieste, and not just of Trieste, of course, of the 20th century, uh, as a kind of, not to say undermine, but like uh, it has a different flavor after the wars uh, in, um, in, um, in the Balkans in the 90s. And then going back to the high map, to the, to the small fatherland, the small, the small motherland, is something, a way to reclaim, uh, acknowledge the failures, the ethical failures of Europe, but also to see whether or not it is possible to start again. There's a lot of, uh, about the Phoenicians that I would like to ask you, but you already discussed about this. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip this passage. I had a question about the antiquarianism in Trieste and how that relates to um, re relates to the to the identity of the city. And uh, just thinking about it, uh, and, and especially during the fascist period, <clears throat> a number of intellectuals in Italy, in order to go between the lines against the, the Romanità, uh, they they try to reclaim another past for. Um, uh, for, for the country or as an alternative past for the country. I'm thinking about the, 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 the idea of the Etruscans. And we have here also um, among the many people that are in uh, here, there is a Marina Piperno who wrote an amazing book about, uh, a remarkable book about uh, uh, the Etruscan in modern Italian literature and uh, L'Antichita Crudele. And uh, maybe uh, uh, we, we can ask a question or invite her another time here later. So. Uh, yeah, the appropriation of the past uh, it could be a, a big, uh, mm, a big question whether or not this has to deal not just with freedom and non-national agencies, but also to a mentality that at any rate is uh, rooted in uh, an idea of, uh, um, of of the nation. Uh, I'm gonna go back to um, to my other two questions, and the, the okay, the introduction. Something that I found very very interesting is that. Uh, this book tried to incorporate uh, uh, Trieste, not just uh, in the Italian history, but in the Austrian, Itali it tried to incorporate it, it Itali the Austrian Italian affairs in, into the canon of, of, uh, of, um, of Central Europe, which is something that um, I would love even to hear more because I think it is a, a, a great move and a necessary move. And in fact, the book is a, in a German studies series. Amazing, something that, I mean, I'm, no German study will ever publish whatever I, uh, I can propose. And, uh, uh, and again, um, going back to, to the idea of, of modernism, uh, this goes to my last two points. Um, one is, a, again, this idea of, a, you know, building on the, the idea of Italian literature, um, you mentioned many authors, uh, again, Mozil, uh, Svevo and, uh, and Joyce. And I wonder why you, you didn't write a chapter. Maybe you can tell me I didn't have enough time or space or the publishing house was like, uh, no, no, you cannot add more pages, but a chapter Umberto Saba, who is the great poet of Trieste and the great poet of the New Roses or living in a, in a city that is uh, in a way the symbol of uprootedness a Jewish, uh, half Jewish writer uh, that chooses uh, he, 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 to write in, in Italian. He is of Italian, uh, let's call it ethnicity, but he's also choosing, he writes about being Italian as a curse. He says, uh, my being born in Italian, not just in Trieste, but in general, it was, it was not great. The, the destiny was not good for me, but he chose Ita Italian because he chose a literature. It, 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 Italy is a is a is a is a is a tradition is a tradition of poetry. His book is called uh, Canzoniere, songbook, clearly referring to Petrarch and uh, you know, countless other poets of the Italian tradition. So, in a way, it was a way to is a complex, very complex modernist. But uh, I see him. Uh, 
in this frame. And I would like to um, also for him, for his gender identity, he was, he was married, he wrote a, a book, uh, uh, Trieste is a woman, but of course he was homosexual. So it's something very, very complex here going on in, uh, in, di in different multi multi-directional experiences. And I would like to, 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 you know, to know your opinion about whether or not Umberto Saba uh, it can be framed in this, uh, in, in, in your book or not. Last point, and I'm sorry for taking so much time, uh, Almost, uh, um, you make a, 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 and this is a way, in a way, it's a follow up to what uh, Constantina said about cosmopolitanism. Uh, page 41 of your book, you write how uh, the Mediterranean, you, you write about the Mediterranean Europe of local cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism. And, uh, and, you, and you make a, a passage from local cosmopolitanism to uh, are the reject, rejection of imperial drives that is de facto post-colonial or, anti, or an anti-colonial drive. Uh, I would like you to ask you more about that because probably I didn't understand this passage clearly because I don't, I mean, there might be a cosmopolitanism that doesn't imply anti-colonial, uh, an anti-colonial stance. And I see this, uh, you know, even in writers that are not just uh, you know from the entire Europe of that time, they were proud of being cosmopolitan, but uh, they were clearly uh, either racist or against a, a, a post-colonial. A, a, you know they were pro pro-colonialism, and uh, and how does this coexist? The rejection of imperial drives of colonial drives with the, the imperial nostalgia that is also part of that culture. Sorry for taking so much time, and I will look forward to the answer. Thank you so much. I mean, Franco, amazing question. So I know that it's very difficult to address all these issues in five minutes each, but I will be very strict because we have so many interesting questions and I want to give the word to other people. So David, it's to you and I'm counting the time. Yes, <laughs> and please stop me. Uh, okay. Yes, I believe that the methodology of microhistory is still a relevant methodology. Also, there is different microhistories, different methodology of microhistories. I know that I should uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, call it global microhistory, like John Paul uh, Gabriel uh, uh, says. But actually, I'm more. Um, I'm more inspired by Francesca Trivellato, so it's also a way for me to answer the question of the cosmopolitanism. Uh, I didn't use the, the, the word cosmopolitan uh, because I think that the model of Trieste does not correspond to the model of Livorno. This is not the communitarian cosmopolitanism that Francesca described for, 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 for Livorno, because, I mean, in terms of structure, Trieste is a radically different city than Livorno. Trieste pre-existed to the free port of Trieste and well, my, my global idea is that uh, the, the, the civic ideal of the new commerce was to integrate the municipality and not to create an original society. So this is for me very different from, 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 from Livorno, but uh, I can elaborate on the, on the cosmopolitanism. I totally agree on the different definition of the diaspora studies you, 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 you gave. I usually try to avoid to place, to place myself within uh, the debate of the di diaspora studies, because in the perspective, in the central European perspectives, uh, the diaspora studies are very different from those who are practiced in the Mediterranean. And at some point, yes, the title is relevant because I think as an Asbury historian, we should read more what is written in, 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 for the Mediterranean. You know, Wolfgang Kaiser used to say, Vienna is the Mediterranean without the Mediterranean. And I, I mean, I was a student of Wolfgang Kaiser, so I, and I truly believe in that. We should more pay attention on the, the diversity of social belongings that those, those actors were able to develop all across the Mediterranean. And despite what we consider as border, meaning religion, languages, or, or, or political affiliation, or, or, uh, or uh, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, th th there is, I, I, I see some question about the Muslims. I can maybe just briefly elaborate on that. Uh, I will give a lecture at the Ariman Institute in one month on that very specific topic. So this is a self advertisement. And uh, yes, uh, what's interesting with the Muslims is that they, 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 
they, they integrated the, the, the political and social clientele of the different city of the Habsburg Empire. So yes, uh, at some point, uh, the Ottoman representative intervened in the system, but they were themselves part of larger clientels. And I try to avoid to see this, this history as a state-to-state -state relationship and more on something like more fluid, meaning I think that the empire just plug on a pre-existing society. And yes, circulation happens and whatever border move, yes, definitely. But I think they move on a pre-existing systems. So just to, it, it's very caricatural in, in the one minute, but uh, this is the, the, the idea of my background. This is what I get from the, the anthropology, actually, from work of Marshall Salins or James Scott, which are very inspiring to me as soon as I try to understand the society from the streets or from the ground and not from, from, from the, the definition provided by the, by the states. Yeah, so my history, just to, to finish with that, is interesting because of course, we deconstruct the category of the state, and at some point, uh, the Greek community in Trieste does not really exist or did not really exist. The, 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 they, they were part of the legal category, but they had many other ways to socialize in the city. I am not sure that the ethno-religious uh, 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 dimension was the most important for them. This is this, this is what I what I wanted to say. But we also had to deconstruct part of what is still a nationalist approach in the Balkan and in Central Europe when we talk about the, 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 the diaspora studies. Again, this is very different from the historiography that we have in the Mediterranean. And sometimes it's a bit tricky. This is why I always try to keep a step back, even if some of my colleagues in Central Europe does not really like that, but I, I really think we should, we should diversify our model like these people diversify their belongings. Thank you, David. That was really illuminating. And uh, you, uh, b before I give the word to Salvador, let me just uh, uh, connect what you said with what Dominique writes there in her uh, question comment, which uh, she she somehow invites us to do also the opposite, like to take Trieste from me and and <laughs> and and give it to the to Central Europe rather than to the Mediterranean. Uh, but but again, yeah, I am. <laughs> You know, it's the same thing that uh, you're telling us that you somehow these two uh, fields should be in more close dialogue. And and in fact, uh, what Dominique says about the uh, the Danube uh, community, even for the things that I study, the more Venetian things uh, may may offer uh, different models. But we'll come back to Dominic's point and perhaps give you the word, Dominic. Let's go to Salvatore. Yeah, certainly, I will try to respond to all the questions in five minutes um, and start with saying that the operation that I'm trying to uh, kind of implement here is to move Trieste um, into the fold of Austrian literary studies, right? Because Austrian and Habsburg historians are obviously kind of very well aware of the importance of Trieste and a lot has been written. Obviously, we have Dominic Rail here. But since I'm in, in, in literary studies, you know, my colleagues in German and Austrian literary studies, you know, think of the Habsburg Empire and, and kind of the post-World War I world in terms of uh, you know, the kind of interaction of, of the German-speaking elites and say uh, the Slavic world, the Hungarian world, Prague, you know, Budapest, and, and so on and so forth. But Trieste is usually in the camp, solidly in the camp of Italian literary studies. And I argue that sometimes that is also to the detriment to uh, you know, kind of the complexity of, of Trieste, which is why I had to make choices. Uh, Franco is correct. Umberto Saba would you know, uh, merit an entire chapter in this, in the same way that Shikyo Slapata uh, would. And, uh, but I had to make choices and I wanted to give a kind of um, feel of the complexity of the many different literatures. And so um, I could have, and this is something I didn't want to do is uh, cut out Srečko Kosovo, right? I, I could have written more about say, Shito Slavkovet or Umberto Saba, who writes about, right? This idea of that uh, Trieste concilia uh, Italiano de Slavo. So it's like a, a meeting point of the Italian and, and, and the Slavic. But that also, that Slavic component, uh, 
uh, Srećko Kosovo and, and Pavel, who uh, Franco rightfully, uh, rightfully mentions, um, would get lost in, in, in that. And so I wanted to foreground the work of Musil, for instance, who has a very strong connection with, with Trieste. And uh, in The Man Without Qualities, um, there's an entire, you know, what I call the Trieste chapter. And, and he says that once in Trieste, you have the rise of irredentism. Uh, in many ways, that is the uh, beginning of the end for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and I want to kind of to emphasize uh, Theodor Deubler, uh, who a lot of people don't know what to do with him uh, because he's German, but he insists, and he writes in German, but he insists on his Triestine um, identity. So in many ways, um, I had to make I had to make uh, I had to make choices. And you're right that when we talk about um, nostalgia, there's a lot of imperial nostalgia, especially uh, in the 1940s uh, on, you know, uh, after World War II and, and uh, kind of retrospectively looking at uh, the empire as this kind of, you know, cute and quaint um, uh, empire. I think in that discussion of nostalgia, what is missing is the attention to uh, the non-national allegiances, right? And here I, I, I am in conversation, I think, and, and really bringing in half to a historiography into the literary studies, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, obviously Peter Judson, of uh, Dominique here, uh, Tara Zara, who, who think about the kind of alternatives to national uh, identification. And while in the past, you know, we've been thinking about, you know, peasants who don't have a fully fledged national identity, I think that can also be applied to these um, literary figures like uh, Italos Bevo, for instance, who have been recruited and co-opted by these narratives of the national literary uh, tradition. And I think this is why the Phoenicians are such an important kind of uh, dimension of this Mediterranean identity. Going back to your uh, question, uh, Constantina, I think that uh, the Mediterranean is uh, a very uh, useful uh, kind of network, a paradigm um, with which we can read uh, with Trieste because what the Phoenicians offer is a different model, one of, I wouldn't even call it, and I say it, it's not really uprootedness. The Phoenicians don't have roots whatsoever. Their identity is aquatic, is maritime. And often when we talk about, you know, the trading posts of, of, of the uh, Phoenicians, we think of Phoenicians arriving on the shores, setting up camp and stopping to trade. Often what they would do is they would stay on their ships and trade out of their ships. And they would develop uh, this kind of urban um, identity, which is urban and cosmopolitan at the same time, in the sense that they develop this kind of pan-Mediterranean diaspora, but they didn't even think of themselves as Phoenicians. They thought of themselves as uh, belonging to a particular city, like Carthaginians uh, or Tyrians. Um, and so, it's that kind of model that is both urban and, and local and kind of cosmopolitan, trans-regional um, that kind of um, surpasses, you know, it's, it's, it's both above and below the nation, right? And it's often an open resistance to national identification. And you see it with, with Idalos Vebo. Um, he writes, he starts, you know, from, Hector, Hector Schmidt, he decides to kind of advertise this kind of double belonging uh, even after the fascists take over, right? I mean, La Coscienza di Zeno, in Zeno the Phoenician, not Zeno of Aaliyah, um, in 1923, right? In Mussolini's Italy, he still says, you know, I'm Italian, but also, but also German, which is obviously problematic. And here we go back to Franco's idea um, of um, silos in Trieste, interrupted networks. Zwebo never ever acknowledges the Slavic presence in, uh, in Trieste. It, like, it, if, if you only read Zwebo, you wouldn't know that you know, it has a very strong Slovenian and Croat uh, uh, presence there. Um, and to respond to kind of the power, power is really writing in the um, 
interpretation of Kosovo, right? And this is exactly what Kosovo does because he criticizes Yugoslavia as well. It's like these, you know, Yugoslavian nationalist nationalisms. Um, he says, I, I, I don't feel comfortable here. And he dies very young, he dies in his early 20s, so we don't have much uh, to work with. You know, he was very prolific. Um, I definitely see power in the tradition of, of, of Kosovo. Um, and uh, because, you know, uh, there, there is definitely some, uh, some, some overlap, uh, some overlap there. Um, Salvatore, I'm afraid you have no more. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, I, 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 will... I hope I was able to kind of, you know, put, Yes, uh, put I mean, it's an ongoing together. discussion anyway. Uh, we'll open to other questions and you may have the opportunity to come back to some of your points. Uh, perhaps I think um, Andy wanted to raise something or if Dominique wants to um, to ex expand on what she she said, perhaps, perhaps let's start with Dominique, okay. Um, I. You know how much I love these conversations. And in many ways, David has already started to answer some of them. But I, I'm, and this is weird because I wrote about the Adriatic as a region. So I should be the first one to say, I, let's do it. But the more I read, the more I think about trading hubs that are also not maritime and how, especially 18th century Trieste really resembles a lot of these trading hubs in the Balkans. And, and I love all this new work that's going on about trans-imperial sovereignty. Um, and I saw the wonderful question uh, by this colleague who, who I've yet to meet, uh, who wrote the book on Galata uh, it, uh, about these communities. I agree, David, with what you're saying. So what are we getting by making this Mediterranean instead of calling it Balkan and, Dan and Danube? And this is going also to Salvatore's point about the erasure of Karat and Slovene in these modernist literatures. As unfortunately, some of you know, I worked on an earlier period and I saw the same fights going on in the 1840s and 1850s um, between Dubrovnik, Dalmatian archeologists who were pushing an Illyrianism. And then you hear this, the beginnings of the Phoenician argument and the Roman argument 30 years before. And, and they're trying to, unbalkanize the city but when they're doing that it's because you're feeling a commonality you don't want or, or something that's changing and so as historians and critics i i i i'm a little nervous of following the trail and so i i'm wondering about yeah it, but i think we're all on the same side i'm just wondering how dangerous is the mediterranean turn yeah that's that's very useful and uh and I think that you already know that, but let me just clarify it for everyone that when I, I refer to the Mediterranean turn, I don't mean so much to the region itself, but uh, a way of thinking uh, historically uh, through interconnectivity and uh, you know networking and so on. Uh, and you know that very well. So it can be also uh, used as Mediterraneanizing the central East Central Europe could be another way of putting this, but without referring specifically to regions. Um, I don't know, I, I, Andy, do you want to um, comment on anything? I know that you're working on these things and you have prepared something. Sure, well, I, it's it's kind of connected to what um, yeah. Dominique was, was saying, so maybe that will give a coherent set of questions. Um, well, both of the presentations were very interesting and they, they work together very well in that one was sort of addressing Trieste from below and the other was addressing it from above in a very interesting and productive way. And I kind of like that image of the difference between the archive of official minorities and the reality uh, of what was really going on. My question is kind of building off of a couple of questions and comments that have come up. Uh, I was really interested in what Franco was talking about with Trieste as not as, as a capital, or at least not perhaps like the other capitals um, of, of literature that we would see at the time. However, it, it does seem to me that in some sense, Trieste is a center of something. Um, and I don't know what, <laughs> but it seems like it is, it, it seems to be in, in this time period that we're talking about that it is the center of gravity in some kind of way. 
So I don't know if, um, uh, you know, either of the presenters, I was kind of thinking, uh, addressing it more to Salvatore, but it, uh, either presenter could probably address that. To what extent is Trieste a center? And maybe there is, uh, that can not lead us to an answer, but enrich the discussion of how useful these categories like Mediterranean, or I was also thinking Adriatic are, what are the limits of them? How can they help us? So I was wondering if, you know, maybe putting that into the discussion, talking about the idea of Trieste as a center. Lastly, I'm, as a literary scholar, I am also outraged at the lack of Saba, but I accept the very valid answer <laughs> that you gave, maybe for the next book. Thank you. Are there any questions immediately or shall uh, or thoughts that can be? Um, okay, I will give the word back to uh, David and then Salvatore and perhaps Franco. Yeah, um, maybe maybe we should also deconstruct our academic uh, categories, our academic department, and uh, maybe to think the budget we have for research in different way. Because when we want to deconstruct the Mediterranean, this is what we we should do actually. If we want to 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 have a more, I mean, a larger history of of the Mediterranean and try to think the geography in in a way that would have been more appropriate according to the practice of the different actor. Well, so I, I had in mind uh, uh, this book of Irineo de la Croce. He was a chronicler of Trieste in the late 17th century, and he produced a very interesting book in terms of just the political dimension of Trieste. And he was actually already uh, debating about the origin of Trieste. So I, I don't think that he mentioned the Phoenician origin of Trieste, but he, he was debating if Trieste was Greek, Roman, or Etruscan. And he says this is an Etruscan city. Contrary to Gorizia, Gorizia was 30 kilometers, is 30 kilometers from, from Trieste, it's very close. And he said Gorizia is a German city. It has been funded by the Norikans. It had strong political implications. First, it's, it definitely connects the Danube with the, the, the Mediterranean already in the 17th century. But depending if Trieste is German, meaning Habsburg, or Etruscan, meaning a free city, this is totally different claims that 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 actually are, are implied in this kind of 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 uh, uh, debates on the origin of the city. I was also wondering, so maybe it could be a question to Salvatore, if there is any political dimension in the claim that Trieste would have been a Phoenician city. I, I don't know be, because for the 17th century, it's pretty clear it's totally fitting with the development of the absolutism in the Habsburg monarchy and Trieste just uh, until uh, Domenico de Rossetti, who is the founder of the Archeografo Triestino, it's a claim for the municipal independence, very clearly. Mm -hmm. Salvador, yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, I, this is how I read this, uh, you know, this Phoenicianism in, in, in Trieste, because it is very much invested in uh, kind of emphasizing the particularity of Trieste, right? And that it's kind of equidistant from the Greeks and the Romans, and it is a specifically kind of uh, Triestine uh, phenomenon, which makes us different from the Italians uh, and the Habsburg Germans, and, uh, and uh, also the kind of uh, Slovenes and Croats. Um, I definitely see that as a precursor to kind of, uh, and kind of part of the conversation of a kind of a political um, urbanism in, um, in, in yes. I do kind of obviously recognize the kind of limitations of this um, Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean container, especially because what happens also, uh, and this is why this is part of the title of the, the, the Habsburg Mediterranean, is part of this conversation is also the Adriatic exhibition in 1930. This is the last exhibition of the, uh, of the empire in which the empire celebrates its colonial holdings um, in, in, in the Balkans. And uh, if you read you know, the, the, the kind of newspapers who advertise this, this event, you know, they make it pretty much clear that this is the new direction uh, of the empire. The strength of the empire lies south. Um, and this idea of making Trieste a more 
uh, active and pronounced kind of maritime, uh, maritime uh, power. But going very briefly back to the kind of Slavic, Slavic component, I, I go back to uh, Srećko Kosovo and the idea of um, Lepa Vida, the legend of Lepa Vida, uh, which, and this ties, uh, David, uh, you know, ties to the kind of Muslim presence uh, at, at some point, because it's the story of, uh, uh, sometimes it's an abduction, sometimes it's a, um, Dalmatian girl who joins a, uh, the Saracens on, on a ship. Um, and that seems to be a kind of volcanic uh, adaptation, reinterpretation uh, of uh, stories that originate with, uh, with Herodotus, right? The kind of a balkanized version of, balkan version of the uh, rape of, of Europa. So you have definitely that kind of convergence of. Um, this, um, you know, uh, look onto, onto the, 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 the Mediterranean, both with the Greeks, but also with, you know, the Saracens and, and uh, pirates and piracy, which is kind of another thing that is very much tied to Trieste, uh, right? The kind of rivalry with Venice. Venice has a lot of kind of beef with Trieste because it suspects, probably correct, you know, rightfully so, that all the pirates hiding in, in, in Trieste, uh, you know, financed by, by the Austrians. Okay, um, let me see. Um, I think, uh, David, you uh, answered uh, the questions we have in the chat about... I tried. <laughs> you tried? Talking I want progress. to invite uh, <laughs> anyone among the people who pose the questions if they, if they want to speak. Then we have some time. Otherwise, if they're happy, um, I will give the word to Franco again, uh, because perhaps you want to comment um, further or uh, comment uh, answer or on the answer. I don't know. Uh, yeah, um, I'm very, very, you know, I think the two presentations were very fascinating because they uh, uncovered, they unearthed a lot of uh, uh, a city like Trieste, which we thought we knew a lot. And actually, it's just at the beginning of a, of a journey in a way, especially coming from the 18th century with, with David. And, uh, and of course, with the, the, how Trieste itself challenges the paradigms of modernism that are not just in literary studies, but like in a classification, if you will, of, of, of modernity as a whole. Uh, yeah, the, um, I find it especially fascinating the idea of the Phoenician Trieste, just, a, you know, end with a remark, also because it might not just lead to an idea of a um, Semitic city the, uh, that is there and, and that it was in the culture of the time, but also of a Levantine city. The, in a way, it's something that we are all, um, you know, especially the national project tried to ostracize calling Levantine something that was uh, detrimental. Uh, in the same, more or less in the same years, the biggest, uh, uh, film of the of the period was uh, uh, Cabiria by Giovanni Pastrone. Uh, I think it's 1914. Is a, a you know a, with the with a with a script written by uh, by D'Annunzio. So it was a huge success. Has been actually the first film that's been uh, uh, projected in the White House in America. So just to tell how important was that film. And that film is about Carthage. It's about the fall of Carthage, of course, rescued by the Romans. Blah blah blah. And which pits uh, a long story of uh, um, classical denial of the roots of uh, the Mediterranean, not just in Greek and Rome, but of course in the Phoenician and other Semitic peoples and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to say that that was really, really, I mean, I think we could understand the thrust of the antiquarians from Trieste to find another origin and other identity because the culture of the time was so full of classical sources that denied existence or validity. I mean, the, the Aeneid is a story of Rome against uh, Carthage, and that was a book that everybody was reading in every liceo, in every school or, or around Europe. And uh, I find it extremely interesting that antiquarians try to find this, uh, you know, maybe not philologically accurate, uh, uh, genealogy of Trieste because it can speak volume on their effort to establish a, another paradigm besides the national one. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I had to I had to cut Cabiria uh, from the kind of first first draft of, of that chapter. Um, 
But my suspicion is that things start really gearing up in the 19th century with the excavations in Carthage, which then led uh, Gustave Flaubert to write Salambo, set right after the first uh, Punic War, which then you know led to Cabiria. So there, it, it, things start in the 19th century. Yeah. That sounds very interesting, and it makes me think also about. Uh... Well, in my new project, I'm studying this emergence of archaeology at the end of the 19th century. And I see that Phoenicians were really fashionable. Like everybody wanted to defend themselves as Phoenician. There was this moment of Phoenician uh, imagination, I, uh, but which then was uh, uh, replaced by, a, by yeah, a different archaeological imaginations, I should say. Uh, but I find it really very interesting. And uh, um, let me say, are there any other questions? We still have uh, like two, three minutes. If there are no other questions, let me say just how happy I was with this, uh, with this conversation today and these presentations and the comments, because it somehow realized my dream in, in of what I'm doing in this colloquium, but also what I'm doing in my department, like to put together history and literature, but also to, you know, to mix regions and, uh, and not just disciplines, but also regions and, and and talk about the Mediterranean and Eastern and Europe, Europe, the Ottoman Empire, but also Italy. So I really loved what happened today here. Uh, thank. I want to thank again our speakers and uh, Franco and everybody who was here. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope to see you in our next uh, colloquium. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much. Congratulations for great papers. <laughs> yes, congrats. Bye.